Welcome to Let's Talk Parkinson's event from Parkinson's Community Los Angeles on a very important and popular topic, driving and Parkinson's. I'm Joe Muller. I serve on the board of PCLA. For those of you who don't know us, we're a Los Angeles-based nonprofit that provides support, resources, and community for families living with Parkinson's. I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event, Abbott, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, and Medtronic. Free programs like this are made possible by donations from our community. If you appreciate free programs like this one, please consider making a donation yourself. You can find the links on our website, pcla.org. Some notes for today's event. We are recording today's program. Your image will not be visible on the video. Please stay muted during the presentation to keep background noise at a minimum. If you have questions or comments, please type them into the chat. If you're not able to type them into the chat, we will look for questions from the audience at the end. Um, please try to ensure your questions are on topic and relevant to the doctor's presentation. Today, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Eric Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a clinical psychologist who has worked with neurologic, neurological excuse me, disorders, including Parkinson's disease for many years. He is the chief mission officer for the Huntington's Disease Society of America and was formerly the Fenton coordinator of Atypical Parkinson's Disease, Disease Clinic at UCLA, where he provided clinical services to patients and families living with Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and atypical Parkinson's disorders. Eric, thank you for joining us today to discuss this really important topic. Hey, Joe, thank you so much. And hey to everybody here on this uh, meeting today, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Joe said, I work with Huntington's disease now, but just about four months ago, I was still working at the Movement Disorder Clinic at uh, UCLA and had worked with people living with Parkinson's and atypical Parkinsonian disorders for many years. So happy to be able to come back and speak with you guys today about this topic. As Joe said, it's a really important topic and it's one that we might not talk about enough um, and we might not talk about it in the best way. So I'm hoping that I can present some, some things for you to think about and to be able to share with people that you know who might benefit from this conversation and just for all of us as human beings who are getting older and dealing with changes that come just from age, never mind what comes with Parkinson's disease, about this idea. So uh, the title of this talk is, I have Parkinson's, can I still drive? And I'm going to give you the very simple answer and the only little attempt at humor I have for you today. And if I can get this to go, it depends. A lot of what we're going to talk about has to do with variables. Things are different for people in their experience with Parkinson's, where it, when in their life it's affecting them, what kind of symptoms they're having, what degree of symptoms they're having. So I just want to say there's a lot of different lifter, a lot of different factors that are variable to the individual. So the answer is not as simple as yes or no. The answer truly is it depends. What I'm going to present to you guys today is informational only. Uh, anything that is a recommendation, of course, these are general guidelines. You should talk to your own team, your neurologist, your medical doctors, other healthcare providers, your family and friends, caregivers, et cetera. You can bring this stuff up and say, hey, I heard about this, but then you're going to want to find out how it might pertain to your particular situation and knowing that it can be different for everyone. So this is for your information and for your um, ability to consider it and talk to your team about it. I want to talk about some of the common concerns that are associated with Parkinson's disease and how they relate to driving. I want to talk about when a person with Parkinson's should really start thinking about, is this time for me to consider stopping driving? And not just, again, the person with Parkinson's, but any person when I might want to consider stopping driving. And then I want to give a few practical ideas about how to approach this. How do you have this conversation? I'm going to present this pretty much straight through to make sure that we leave some time for Q&A at the end. I know there's been some already submitted, but I want to make sure you all got some time at the end of this today. So how does living with Parkinson's impact a person's ability to drive? I don't think this is news to most people here, but it's always good to just give a quick overview of what is Parkinson's disease. We know that PD is a progressive, meaning it changes over time, neurodegenerative, which means it affects the brain and it causes, um, 
causes more problems as it goes along condition. So it's a progressive neuro neurodegenerative condition. It's going to get worse over time. The movement symptoms, the motor symptoms, if you will, that are hallmarks for Parkinson's are stiffness, slowness, tremor, kind of the shaking, trembling of your hands or feet, um, postural instability, falling, balance issues, etc. Parkinson's also has some features that are what we call non-motor symptoms. And these can include things like mood symptoms, the way you feel, anxious or depressed, for example, cognitive dysfunctions, changes in the way that a person thinks, and some of the, in some cases, things like hallucinations or delusions. The reason I'm emphasizing the non-motor symptoms now is very often when it comes to driving, these things are going to be potentially more problematic even than the physical symptoms of Parkinson's. So just wanna put that out there now. And I mentioned this before when I was saying what, you know, what neurodegenerative means is things aren't gonna get worse over time. Things will change and get worse over time as we're living with something like Parkinson's and as we are aging. So why are we even talking about this today? Really, whenever I would have this conversation in clinic and any time I present on this, um, which isn't a lot. This is my first time talking to folks about it with Parkinson's, but I have talked about it in other disease groups too. It really is about safety. Safety first and foremost. And this is for safety for the person who's got Parkinson's and driving, safety for the people that are in the car with that person, safety for the people who are outside of the car where that person might be driving. It's really truly about safety. This is not a judgment. This is not a, not a, you know, you should know better kind of thing. It's really just, man, when we approach this, we are thinking about it from the perspective of safety. So let's talk about those motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease just a little bit. And I picked this picture just because I think it gives you a good sense of where we're going with this, with how could the motor symptoms of Parkinson's affect driving. So again, we're talking about those I mean, we're going to talk about three of them more so than loss of balance, because I sure hope that you're not walking around in your car when you're driving. Um, we'll, we'll focus a little bit on tremor, bradykinesia, or the slowness of movement, and then stiffness. So let's start with tremor. When you think about how tremor, right, that kind of shaking of the hand or shaking of the feet, uh, primarily, how might that affect a person's ability to drive? A lot of times people who live living with Parkinson's will say, you know, it feels like I have a hard time keeping my foot on the gas because my foot's shaking. So it's like you're kind of pumping the brake or pumping the gas pedal or the brake pedal for that matter. Um, makes it difficult to steer, makes it difficult to manipulate things in the car like the turn signal or the gear shift or, you know, the door locks or adjusting a mirror. Things like rigidity or stiffness, just moving more slowly or having a harder time moving can affect things like steering, right? We could see issues sometimes with people even just keeping their car going straight in the lane or making a turn and kind of turning too wide and you kind of turn into the oncoming traffic lane. It makes it harder for people to check their mirrors. If, if you've kind of got a stiff neck, right? Like you can't turn your head and check over your shoulder like you are trained in driver's training, or at least that's how I remember it, right? Or even just being able to turn your head to see from side to side in the rear view mirrors, that can be affected. And lastly, kind of the slowness of movement. Things can happen when you're driving that are gonna be outside of your control. A car cuts you off. Uh, child or an animal runs into the street, a uh, car, four cars in front of you rear end someone and a kind of domino effect occurs. The person with Parkinson's might not be able to respond quickly enough to make an adjustment as needed. So those are the those are kind of the main like how do the how do the motor symptoms or the movement symptoms of Parkinson's affect movement or affect driving, things like dystonia right, which can cause let's say dystonia in the foot, which causes the foot to kind of turn or maybe be a little bit painful. How could that affect your braking? How could that affect um, your ability to quickly adjust from gas to brake? Right, these are all important things to think about. How do those movement symptoms potentially affect driving? 
And now some of the things that are even a little bit more impactful because they happen in a different way. That some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, we're really gonna focus solely on the cognitive, um, cognitive and psychiatric aspects of that. Um, some of the main ones, particularly in relationship to driving that I'm gonna focus on are listed here. Paying attention to things, how fast you're able to uh, process information, memory, um, the decision-making part of your brain, that frontal, frontal processes, the executive functioning, we call it the boss of the brain, and then visuospatial issues. How are you able to process information that you're seeing? When you think about attention, right? Having impaired attention, not being able to pay attention like you used to, how could that affect driving? I mean, multitasking, right? When you're driving, you're checking, you know, to make sure that no one's in the lane beside you. You're looking up in front of you to see if the light is changing. You're constantly scanning to see if that kid or animal is running into the street. And you're trying to make sure that, you know, what street am I gonna turn on? This is a lot of information that your brain is paying attention to and needs to know what it's doing with it. And if you're having a harder time processing information, that attentional ability, concentration even, that's where things can go wrong. If you are having a hard time multitasking, I can't pay attention to more than two things at any given time, that could affect the way that a person drives. Miscalculations, right? Uh, it's something that I think we think about a lot when you're first learning how to drive is how much pressure do I have to put on the brake in order to stop by the time I get to that stop sign? But after you've driven for a while, you don't necessarily think about that anymore. Your brain's just kind of used to it. But if you have Parkinson's and due to the changes in your brain, that's not working as well. That can lead to people all of a sudden realizing they have to slam on their brakes because they didn't slow down enough and there's a car in front of them they're getting really close to really quickly. De uh, inability to concentrate or having a harder time concentrating, that's again, that kind of multi-stimuli, a lot of things going on in the world outside of, outside of your car that could affect the way that you're driving. When it comes to slower processing speed, this really just means my brain doesn't manage information as quickly as it used to. I might see the light turn red and instead of my brain going instantaneously, you have to stop, it might take a click or two. But when you're driving, that click or two could have negative impact, right? When you see something out of the corner of your eye, your brain is saying, you better make sure that's not an oncoming car and I'm gonna get T-boned, right? Or I better make sure that that's not a kid running out between two parked cars. Your brain might take that second or two to get there where something could potentially happen. So again, processing speed is how quickly you, how quickly you understand and react to some data that you're getting. And if you have Parkinson's, that can sometimes be slower, which could have a negative impact on a person's driving. Memory deficits. I, I, I pulled this cartoon because I, it made me laugh and it's so true, right? Getting lost can happen, right? Can happen no matter where you're at in your life or where you're at in your experience of living with Parkinson's. But we do know that Parkinson's disease can affect memory. So we can see people getting lost. You know, mom left the house to go to the market. She's done that you know, every other day, every three days for the last 30 years. It's been an hour. Where is she? She took a wrong turn. And now she doesn't know where she's at, right? Because not only is memory potentially an issue, but now what do I do that I'm in an unfamiliar environment? And, you know, one, I, I don't have this in here, but just think about it. If you're now all of a sudden someplace where you don't know where you're at, you're probably starting to feel stressed. You're starting to probably feel anxious. And guess what happens when you start to feel stressed or anxious? It makes it even harder to remember. It makes it even harder to figure something out. So that adds to it. I included difficulty working a vehicle. 
cars are cars are changing all the time, right? If you're driving the same car that you've driven for 20 years, chances are you know how to do it. But if you got a new car and all of a sudden it's like, wait, this is automated or wait, this is the thing that actually goes from park to drive. Sometimes it's about knowing how to and understanding how to and remembering how to work the vehicle that can become impaired. Executive functioning is that kind of boss center of the brain, the part of the brain that's in charge. When a person living with Parkinson's experience deficits in executive functioning, that's gonna impact a person's ability to make decisions. Makes it much harder for that person to problem solve, right? My example of mom going to the market and turning on the wrong street and then not knowing what to do and not being able to figure out what to do. And, and you know, instead of stopping and parking and pulling out her cell phone and calling and saying, hey, I'm lost. She just kept driving. She figured that she would, she thought she would figure out how to undo what had happened, right? That ability to problem solve can become impaired, can be further complicated by stress. Um, I, just, I, I just said something that I realized I probably didn't build into this. I sure hope that when mom is out driving and gets lost, she pulls over and uses her cell phone to call. Not that she uses her cell phone while she's still driving around. Because what I talked about multitasking, one of the worst complicators of multitasking is using this thing when you're behind the wheel. No one should do it. A person living with Parkinson's shouldn't do it. A person who doesn't have Parkinson's shouldn't do it. A person who's 65 shouldn't do it. A person who's 18 should not do it. That is a distractor. And that takes away from a person's ability to multitask, to pay attention to multiple stimuli. If you are someone who has some level of um, impairment, trying to minimize the level of distractibility, trying to minimize the number of stimuli is really important. Don't use that phone. It's the easiest one you can do. Put it in the glove box, throw it in the back seat until you get where you're gonna get. Put it away. I mentioned the visual spatial, visual spatial difficulties that people can have. And this is about perception, being able to interpret and make interpret data and make estimates, right? Like depth perception. A lot of times we think about it as, you know, if you're walking down the street and you take a step off the curb, you might not really be able to gauge how big of a step that is, and that can lead to a fall. Or stepping up on a curb, and you don't raise your foot high enough, and it gets caught on the, on the cement. The same thing can happen when you're driving. How far is that car in front of me? You're making an estimate, but if your visual spatial perception is off, you might make the wrong estimate. You might think you've got more space between you and therefore more time than you actually do. Another thing that can happen in Parkinson's disease is what we call these visual misperceptions. Sometimes I'm pretty sure everyone's uh, aware of hallucinations and delusions, right? Sometimes seeing something that isn't actually there, but there's also this thing that's called illusions, which is sometimes a misinterpretation of a shadow, right? You might see a shadow out of the corner of your eye. And if you interpret that as a car, you might react to it as if it were a car, which could potentially be problematic. Or you may have been experiencing illusions and you've started to say, oh, I'm just gonna disregard it. And it might actually be something. So being very aware of what a person is experiencing and how that might affect them. So why am I presenting all this to you? I'm not doing it just to scare you. And it's, well, maybe a little bit to scare you. This picture is meant to scare you. This is why we're talking about it. We don't want it to come to this. And I'll just tell you all right now, don't Google images of car crashes because it's not pleasant, but that might be enough to get someone to say, hey, I really need to think about what I'm doing. But if you aren't thinking about this, if you are not talking about it, Unfortunately, it can end in a bad situation to the person driving, to the person with the person driving, 
to the dog in the back seat, to anyone outside of your vehicle, whether they're in another car, whether they're on the street, whether they're sitting in their house or at the window seat in a restaurant. This is truly about doing everything a person can and being open to any of the input that they might receive about being safe for everyone involved. So we've already been talking about it for 20 minutes. So you're probably like, all right, this is how we talk about it. But I actually want to focus a little bit more on how do you as a person living with Parkinson's talk about it? How does you as someone who might be living with a person who has Parkinson's talk about it? How do providers talk about it? How do the collective you talk to your providers about it? I hope you've heard a common theme in what I was just saying is talking about it. We need to talk about driving more. We should talk about driving more. We should talk about driving from really early on in someone's experience of having Parkinson's disease. Because as we say, Parkinson's is a progressive condition that will change over time. As symptoms change, as things get worse, as a person ages, all of the things that are important for you to be able to do to drive are gonna be impacted. So, talking about it. Talking about it isn't fun. Nobody wants to have this conversation. The person who's driving doesn't wanna have the conversation. The person who has Parkinson's who's driving doesn't want someone to bring it up to them, doesn't wanna share it because they might be worried about what would happen. Sometimes even on the provider side, you don't wanna talk about it because there's so many other things that the person is you know, focused on, or there's a more important thing that they wanna talk about. So you're just like, oh, I'll get to that next time. Nobody likes having this conversation. I may have made this uh, comment, I think before all of y'all got on, but it's one of those things, we, we, we think about driving as independence, right? If I can't drive anywhere, I can't do anything, right? Like, oh, it's, you know, all I want to be able to do is go where I want to go when I want to go there. And, you know, for those of you that are based in Los Angeles, there's Los Angeles especially, driving equals identity, driving equals freedom and independence. We get it. I get it. I understand. I feel it. But then there's also times where you're like, look, it's not the only way. If we can start thinking about that and start talking about it differently, we might not hold on to this belief so hard. A very common statement that I heard and that I'm sure a lot of people here might recognize is, man, if I have to give up my driving, that just means that, you know, things are worse, right? Oh, God, you know, my wife or my husband or my doctor keeps talking about my driving, what they're really saying is that I'm getting worse. Going back to what I said before, what we're talking about is safety. We're not making any judgment on your disease, your Parkinson's. It may be contributing to this, but we're talking about safety. But a lot of people are going to interpret that as an indication, as an obvious sign that things are worse. It is a difficult conversation. It's, it just is. But that doesn't mean it's an impossible conversation. We can have this conversation. We do have this conversation. We might not ever like it, but we can have it. So in an ideal world, what happens? The person who's living with Parkinson says, you know what? I'm done. That's it. Here's the keys, I'm not driving anymore. That's the ideal world. And there are cases where that happens. And man, I hope I'm that person at some point in my life, whether I have Parkinson's or I'm just older, I hope that I can get there. People do, but not a lot, right? A lot more people have to actually talk about it. So this is the idea. So what do I recommend? Start the conversation early. If we are talking about this 
from the time that a person has just learned that they've got Parkinson's. I learned that I got the person who comes to the clinic and says to me, hey, Eric, I learned that I got Parkinson's because I had a tremor in my right hand. They're still able to drive. They recognize the tremor, but it's not affecting what they're doing. Great, let's have a conversation about this. You know, this is how Parkinson starts. It will change over time. It will have more of an impact on things as the disease progresses. One of those things will be driving. Now, if you're that person who's just coming in and saying, well, you know, doc, I just have a little bit of tremor in my hand. I'm like, no, I get it. But, you know, we've, we're going to, you know, as we work together, we're going to talk about, you know, what you might expect and how you're experiencing things. But I just want to put some things out there for you to start thinking about now. If we start the conversation early, it allows a person to have a little bit more awareness of what they're experiencing and how that might relate to this specific topic, right? It also starts people uh, starts giving people an opportunity to be thoughtful about, yeah, if you know if my Parkinson's changes enough that it does get kind of scary for me to drive, I don't want my kids or my grandkids to be in the back seat and have something happen. I don't want anything to happen to, you know, my wife or my husband or you know, the dog. I don't want to potentially hurt someone else. Being able to be thoughtful about what a person might expect and what could happen, as well as what is the possible outcome if I am driving in a, in a way that is not safe. And then just hitting this one more time, it's about safety again first and foremost for yourself and for everybody else. How do we talk about this? You know, what I just presented is was really for the person with Parkinson's, but it's important to think about the people who are with the person who has Parkinson's. People who are with that person, family members, spouses, kids, People don't like having this conversation because it's hard, right? It's hard because, you know, if I say, hey, dad, hey, mom, hey, honey, I think we need to talk about something. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to make them mad. I don't want them mad at me. I don't want to hear, oh, you just say this because you're a nag, right? Like, you don't know what I can do. I think a lot of us go into this possible conversation with those thoughts in our heads, and that can sometimes get a person to not want to engage in the conversation. I don't want to, I don't want to make him or her feel badly. I don't want them to get upset with me. I don't want this to become a bigger deal than it needs to be. That family input is oftentimes, though, really important because the person who's living with the disease, the person who's got Parkinson's might not be as aware of it as anyone would hope. Why? Because they've been living with it and they've learned, learned to drive with it, right? They can make accommodations or they can do some compensatory things, but those things only go for so long. And their understanding or belief of what they're able to do is sometimes compromised. Yeah, I'm totally fine, nothing ever happens. But then you walk around to the passenger side of the car and it's like, oh my God, why are all these little scrapes on the, on the passenger side? Do you ever hit the garage when you drive in and out? Nope, and there's scratches up and down. You look at the, the rims on the tires on the passenger side and you get a sense of how often a person hits a curb. You hear someone say, oh, it was nothing. It was just a little fender bender. They didn't even take my insurance. Sometimes the person's own ability to perceive what's going on isn't as good as it should be. So having family input is very important, but that person doesn't want to hear it. Again, I said this before at that first point, but it's the, you know, you're just on my case all the time anyways. All you do is focus on my Parkinson's disease, right? There's a lot of common refrains and look, nobody likes having someone tell them that they're not good at something. 
nobody likes having someone who maybe loses their patience because they're just a human being and maybe they're burdened with a lot of other stuff and they just say, you can't do this anymore. Whoa, why are you yelling at me, right? Like that's not gonna help this conversation. Having the exchange between family members can be really, really important because A, people don't wanna have the conversation, P, B, people don't wanna hear that conversation. This is tough because, you know, having sat in clinic and talked to someone who's living with Parkinson's and looking to their left or right or whomever, whatever side that other person's on, and the person with Parkinson's answers one thing, and you look at the spouse, the caregiver, the family member, and you see them go, it's important that a provider is able to get input from multiple sources, the person who's living with Parkinson's and the person who's living with the person who has Parkinson's or is friends with them or cares for them or is the kid who lives across state lines. It's important to get multiple perceptions. It's important for the doctor to be a part of this conversation and to get information. Because again, when you're going in for your neurological exam, what's this telling me about your driving? What's this telling me about your driving? Doctors can make, you know, I, they can say, okay, I get it. Like I put enough of these pieces together and I can formulate that, but it's not the same as being in the car with you or seeing you on the road. Um, it's important to get input so that the doctor knows what they're working with. And oftentimes that means getting multiple sources of input. I want to hear your story and I want to hear your story. I understand that they might be different stories and I understand it can be difficult for you to say this in front of each other, but it's very important because what we're talking about is safety. And in order to make sure that I know what's going on, I want to hear both perspectives. It's hard, but it's important. So talking about stopping driving, Doctors should be a part of this conversation. I've said this before, and if it's not happening already, I dare you, the next time you see your doctor say, have we talked about driving? Should we talk about driving? I'd like to talk about driving. The doc might be like, whoa, where's this coming from? And they're, then you're gonna say, well, I heard this presentation and they're gonna go, "Ugh, Eric. <laughs> um, Maybe, but I also hope that they say, okay, look, this is an important topic. Let's talk about it. Are you still driving? How do you feel like your driving is going? Have you experienced it? It opens the opportunity to have this conversation. If you've not had it already, I encourage you to take the opportunity to do so. It's understandable that a person might go into their doctor and say, I don't want to tell them anything. I don't want them to know because they're gonna make me stop. They might, you know, depending on all of these different variables we talked about, right? There's not a simple yes or no to, can I still drive? You gotta factor in all of these details. But if you're not giving your doctor information, if you're deliberately holding off on providing information, it's affecting what they're able to do for you. This isn't always as simple as a yes or no. You can still drive or you shouldn't, you can't drive. There's things along the way that you can talk to your doctor about. Again, there it's not super easy for a doctor to assess your driving ability sitting in an exam room, but they're gonna be looking at different features, things that we talked about here today. Where is Mary at with her motor symptoms? I've noted that you know, her response time is getting much slower. How might that relate to her ability to steer a car, keep it straight in the lane, navigate a fairly sharp turn, right? When the doctor is assessing for your tremor, they might be thinking about, okay, you might say, oh, it's really affecting you know, how I'm writing you know, my handwriting or it's affecting how I eat. 
And they might be thinking, it's probably affecting how you drive too. Hopefully that's brought up, but hopefully you'll bring it up too. Doc, I've been noticing that I'm having a harder time keeping a steady speed when I'm driving because my foot is tremoring so much. Share that information because you can't assess for it directly unless they're getting in the car with you. And most doctors aren't going to do that. Right? You, me, I say that jokingly. It's not like it's just because they don't want to get in the car with you, but they can't, right? If you've gone to a doctor's office for a visit, a movement disorder specialist or your doctor's office, you know that they're seeing a bunch of other people. We're not getting in the car with every single person. There are, however, places that you can do that. If you say, hey, doc, I'm not sure how good my driving is anymore. There's places you can go to find out. The DMV is absolutely one of those places. But I will tell you this, if you go to the DMV and you don't pass the test, they will right there in the moment take your driver's license away. That's it, done. But there are places you can go, Rehabil rehabilitation facilities, right? Cedar sinai has one, uh, Cal State Northridge has a program where you can work with a rehab specialist, either an occupational therapist or a physical therapist who will ride with you on a contained course and provide information and feedback and recommendations. It's not an immediate report to the DMV situation. If it's egregious, right? Like if you get the PT in the car and the first thing is you drive into the side of a building, I sure hope that they're gonna report that. But they are the ones to say, you know, you tend to favor your right side versus your left side and you drift a little bit this way. What kinds of things can you do to, you know, Make sure you're turning your head a little bit better so you're paying attention to things. Talking to those rehab specialists who can actually give you information and advice. There's opportunities here. Talking to your neurologist can get you connected to that. Talking to your neurologist can also potentially get you reported to the DMV. Why? Because doctors are mandated reporters. In six states, California being one of them, um, to report people to the DMV if they think they aren't capable of driving. Now, some cases it's it's easy, right? Like if someone has a seizure and you go to see a doctor for epilepsy and they say, yeah, you had a seizure, I need to report you to the DMV. We can't have someone passing out while they're driving. People who have orthostatic hypotension or dysregulated blood pressure with Parkinson's who may get faint or may get woozy might get reported. And should be having those conversations with their doctor if they are ever behind the wheel and it's like, woof, I'm getting a little loopy here. Tell your doctor. I didn't include this and now I'm regretting it, but we talked about motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. I should have also mentioned side effects and medications for Parkinson's disease. Some of the medications that are used to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's that allow a person to move better can make people really sleepy. If you've taken your carbidopa levodopa and it kind of makes you a little sleepy and you get behind the wheel and you're at a long red light and you just shut your eyes for a second, that's important and is really important. You doze off for a second and your foot slips off the brake pedal. You doze off for a second and you open your eyes and everyone's gone and you slam on the gas and the light changes again. These are very unfortunate situations, but things to be aware of and things to have the conversation with your treatment team about. It's not just the symptoms of the disease. It can sometimes be the side effects of the medications that are used to treat the symptoms of the disease. So again, lots of moving pieces here, lots of parts of this equation that are constantly things people should be paying attention to and dealing with. I put up here that the doctor's words can sometimes carry more weight. And what I mean is, me talking to my husband or my wife saying, hey, you know, I'm concerned about your driving. They might just be like, yeah, you're concerned about everything I do. You complain about everything I do, <sighs> right? Like how many of us have ever had a similar version of that? Um, that's a little dramatized, but you know what I mean. But sometimes hearing it from the doctor, Joe or Mary, I think we need to have a serious talk about this. What you might be dismissive of to family members, to your wife, husband, kids, et cetera, you might listen to a, a little bit more from your doctor. And your doctor might emphasize it a little bit more too. 
because doctors can sometimes be held responsible if you are in an accident. Your doctor was treating you for Parkinson's, but you also had a uh, real bad chronic pain. So they prescribed pain meds, which might've made you additionally sleepy. Your doctor could potentially be in a position of um, being liable for something too. Not just you. I mean, you, you, the person driving the car are first and foremost, but there's a further reaching net that could get affected. So make sure to have these conversations with your doctor. And sometimes the doctor can help emphasize something that a family member doesn't do in the exact same way. And that doctors are mandatory reporters. If something egregious is happening and it's very, oh, very obvious, I, I shared an example with, um, while I was putting this together, I, I'm a psychologist. I'm not a mandated reporter when it comes to driving. However, I had a person come in who reported to me that on their drive to the clinic at UCLA, they had two fender benders and then they, don't re they couldn't remember where their car was parked in the UCLA parking lot, which in itself isn't that surprising, but putting all the pieces together, I walked into the neurologist's office and like, you have to you have to do something here. It's hard. And, and I can tell you that was a very hard conversation. You're not driving home from our visit today, right? It's not like we'd even laid the groundwork for it. It just came up and it was like, oh, we have to act here. This is an immediate safety concern. That's why I talk about it sooner rather than later. Far too often, we're only having this conversation when it's already a scary situation where someone may or may not have or may have had an accident or has had a couple of co close calls, right? We want to have these conversations sooner than later. We don't always do that. So how do we have it when we need to? That first tip, of course, as early as possible. Early is, hey, when we get done with this session today, you want to talk about it? And the person goes, nope, don't want to talk about it. Understandable. So point number two is try to have regular, meaning repeated conversations about it and try to keep them pretty short. Hey, honey, I just want to say, you know, you've been living with Parkinson's for about 10 years. I think driving is an important thing that we should be talking about. What, do you have any immediate concerns? Did I do anything today? No, 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 it's not that. But I want to start talking about this because we know that Parkinson's changes over time. We know that we're both getting older and that affects things. But I think it's better if we talk about it now. And why I'm bringing you this up is because I'm coming from a place of concern. I love you. I don't want you to die in a car accident. I don't want you to kill someone else in a car accident. Oh my God, why are you going there? Because I don't want it to go there. That's why I'm having the conversation with you today, because I care. And it's really about safety. It's your safety and well being. It's my safety and well being. It's the grandkids' safety and well being. It's the people on the streets' safety and well being. I know this is a really hard conversation to have. I know that nobody likes thinking about it, especially us Los, Los Angelinos, right? Like, peel these keys from my cold, dead hands. Nobody likes it. And we recognize how hard it seems when you think about it. But you know what? There are other options. You know, our next door neighbor, Bob, he's, he's always said, I'm happy to take you guys places. I'm happy to take you to the grocery store. Setting up support, setting up resources, Uber, Lyft, access. There's a lot of things out there. Outside help is available. That's great for the people who talk about it, but what about the people who don't? What if the person with Parkinson's is not stopping? First, talk to the doctor. Hey, doc, you should really know he's had two fender benders in the last week. All right, now that I know that, that's something that I have to work with. You can file reports with the Department of Motor Vehicles. And in the state of California, you can actually do it anonymously. If you are concerned about someone's driving, I mean, don't do it just to be nasty, right? I always want to put that disclaimer on here. Some people are just mean and do things. But if you're really concerned about a person's safety, you can make a report, which will then have the DMV contact someone saying you need to come in for an assessment. 
these are kind of like, if a person is not engaging, first you talk to their care team, then consider that. Then things can get a little bit more dramatic. Taking away the keys. This is, you know, a lot of factors have to be considered is, does mom get violent when she's confronted? Then I'm not gonna do this, right? Or am I worried for my own safety if I do these? But if you're not, these are things that you consider. Mom, that's it, we're done. We're taking away the keys, we're selling the car. You might get some razzle frazzle, but that might be all you get. But if you're worried about more, don't do this. If it's really bad, you can contact local law enforcement. My dad has advanced Parkinson's disease. He's got cognitive impairments. He's hallucinating. He will not stop driving. Providing context. It's not like you're just calling 911 and saying someone's doing something bad. You're calling and saying, this is why. And you might even, you hopefully already step one, you've already consulted with the family physician or your neurologist, so you've got additional backup for it. So being able to think about those things. These are kind of the worst case scenarios, right? Really, truly, this is, this is where we wanna be. This is where we figure out what to do in kind of the emergency situation. The whole reason that we're having this conversation at all today, the whole reason that we're talking about Parkinson's and driving is safety. Safety for everyone involved. Safety for the person with Parkinson's who's driving, safety for the people in the car, safety for the people outside of that car. This is just a quick recap, but Joe, I appreciate you coming on because let's, I, I, I've been watching some questions coming in. I'm like, man, there's, there's, a, there's always some great questions with this group. And this is a real good uh, discussion topic. So thank you, Eric. That, that was fantastic. So let's start with our questions, as you mentioned. And let's see what we have starting at the top. Um, this is from Shakira. Does Parkinson's affect cognitive awareness to be able to decide if they themselves can no longer drive? Her father is saying that he will tell her when he can no longer drive. So the answer is it depends and absolutely it can. Yeah, 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 I'll tell you when it's a problem but they might not be able to fully assess, right? That's the, you know, if you check on the passenger side and that's all scraped up and the driver's side looks great, they might not be aware of what's happening on that side. Uh, or they may, they may minimize it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I bumped into him at the light. He just kind of shook his fist out the window and then he took off. You still bumped into him at a light, right? People might assess it differently. So yes, changes in cognition can lead to a person not assessing something appropriately. Again, talking to the team and having multiple conversations can help with that. Um, doctor, to the best of your knowledge, does the California Department of Voter Vehicles have any specific requirements relative to Parkinson's? I can happily say that I don't know what happens at the DMV. Um, that's a very complicated structure, but joking aside, the DMV is equipped to address people's concerns of having health conditions that affect driving. Are they specific to Parkinson's? I can't answer that, but yes, the DMV will be able to provide information about health conditions that could impair a person's ability to drive. Okay, a couple of the other questions that have come in were very similar. So I'm gonna move on to a unique question. Um, this is from Jen. Does experiencing high anxiety while driving with Parkinson's indicate that cognitive issues are problematic? Great question and not necessarily. Like anxiety can be there on its own. Bless you, Joe. Um, it, you know, anxieties can be its own thing. Anxiety can exacerbate other things, meaning if you get really anxious, it makes it harder to think. It makes it easier to forget. Does that mean that those are cognitive symptoms because of the disease or are there cognitive symptoms that get a little bit worse when there's more stress on the system or stress within the system like anxiety is? So they aren't necessarily linked. They can both be there and the cognitive symptoms might potentially be more obvious when someone is feeling highly anxious, right? They might be things that they compensate for a little bit better when they're totally chill, but under high stress, you might not be able to manage as well. 
Okay, um, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to give the opportunity for spoken questions for anyone who isn't able to type. Please unmute and say your <laughs> name clearly when I call on you. Let me see if I see anybody who's put their hand up. If anybody has a question, I can't, there's so many screens, please go ahead. Larry, you're, you're on mute, Larry, but you have, looks like you have a question. Yeah, there's some of the considerations you referred to that are part of the normal aging process and some of them are not. Are there two or three or some limited number that are more distinctly PD or are they just gradations of the same limitations on our driving ability? Larry, that's a great question. And it's kind of, it, everything is kind of on a continuum. What we might suspect is that if a person has Parkinson's, you could potentially see more of that cognitive impairment, right? We will sometimes say, uh, you might've heard the term, and I may have said this in a previous talk too, but you probably heard this mild cognitive impairment or MCI as related to Parkinson's disease is generally a level of impairment that is greater than that of what is expected from normal aging. So the person with normal aging might be like, what was his name again? You know, I know I just met him, but you know, I can't remember his name. Mm -hmm. The person with MCI might be like, yeah, nothing can't get there, can't even remember why I might know this name, right? Like it's a little bit more so. Uh, the name forgetfulness isn't a great example right now, but directions, right? Getting lost once in a while happens to people, right? You get distracted. You don't turn at the turn that you know you were supposed to turn on. You catch yourself a couple blocks later. A degree of exacerbation of that a little bit worse is you didn't make the turn. And then when you made the next turn, then it was just like, wait a second, now I'm really confused. And it starts to snowball a little bit. So yeah, it's a little bit more so on the scale. We can see an age-related stuff. You know, the variable there too is age, right? Like a person who's 75 compared to the person who's 90 might be different. So yeah, it's usually a little bit more so on the continuum, if that helps. And one, one other thing, and I've experienced this myself where I don't want to put a burden on somebody. So I'm reluctant to bring up the need for some help because my need is going to be satisfied by burdening someone else to either drive me or do things for me. Larry, you brought up one of my favorite words in just being a human being. I don't want to burden someone else. I don't want to ask you to help me because that just puts it on your plate, right? Mm -hmm. Let the other person tell you if it's a burden or not. Most of us are never even going to make the ask because we've already determined that that's going to be problematic to them. But I, I can't tell you enough how many people are surprised. It's like, yeah, I asked my neighbor if I didn't want to do this for like a year. But then I asked my neighbor if he would mind picking me up something when he goes to the grocery store. And he was like, oh my God, I'd be so happy to do so, right? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I am so sorry to bother you, honey, but to your kid or whomever, right? Like, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I've got a dental appointment in two weeks. I don't feel comfortable driving across town. Would you be willing to take me to? Oh my God, dad, yeah, totally. I can make that work. Or you know what? I can't do it that day, but let me check with one of my kids. I think they can do it. A lot of times we, the person, are not going to make the ask because we've already determined that it's a burden for the other. Let the other let you know. Thank you. No, thanks for bringing that up. I, that, that's an awesome, awesome point. That's a great note to end on, Eric. Thank you again, and thank you all for joining us today. Before we let you go, we want to make sure you know about our upcoming events, including a panel discussion about women with Parkinson's and presentations on DBS and occupational therapy for Parkinson's. Information on these events and all our upcoming events and support groups can be found on our website, pcla.org. Please note the dates and times are also available on the website. Um, today's event was brought to you by our sponsors, Abbott, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, 
and by you guys. If, um, by donating, you can join our mission to improve the lives and families in our community who, of people living with Parkinson's. PCLA is a nonprofit and all our donations are tax deductible. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider supporting us by making a donation at pcla.org to help us continue our work and continue to provide programs like this for free. As always, please reach out to us with any questions. You can reach us at info at pcla.org or by phone at area code 310-880-3143 and also on our website, pcla.org. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you, doctor. Thanks, Thank you all. You. Thank you, Eric. It was great.